Hi, everyone. <clears throat> so first of all, I just wanted to say a uh, really big thank you and hello to Brian Rowe, who I've just been watching his videos and um, I recommend you check out his channel. Um, I will link it in the comments. And now I'm going to, I mean, he inspired me to shoot another video, actually, because I had been really distracted by political stuff and um, kind of uh, devolving into arguing with people about really trivialities. So um, I wanted to talk about something spiritual that are actually more paranormal, I guess, um, that I experienced recently. I had to go to Laos to um, renew my visa for Thailand. And uh, so I had read about this place in Laos, in the Jiang Kuang province, where they have these 2,000 year old stone jars. And if you're looking at the thumbnail, you're probably hoping that I have footage of this, which was originally the plan. Um, <clears throat> I was going to shoot like a travel log, but I got so excited when I saw the jars that um, I was clicking madly and I wasted all my battery on stills. So we don't have that. But um, I'm going to tell you the story of, of this experience. Basically, there are these 2,000 year old stone jars uh, scattered throughout Chiang Kuang. Um, it's a town, but it's also like a province in Laos. And um, nobody knows what they are, who put them there, why. Local legend says that they were used for making rice wine by giants. Um, which, I mean, it's as good an explanation as any, really. Certainly, if people were making rice wine, they would not have to make them so big, because you can fit, you could stand in one, so... Um, I was joking with my friend that they look like pickle jars for giants to pickle people and eat them. <laughs> which is my dark sense of humor. Anyway, um... Anyway, I was so excited to do this because I have had many places in the world that I have wanted to visit throughout my life, and it's only in the last couple of years that I have got to visit two of them. One was the Menri Monastery, which is the Bon Monastery in India, which is the only official Bon Monastery, I think, in the world, which is the pre-Buddhist Tibetan religion. Um, and I had read about it for years, and I was very fascinated. It's very focused on magic. And uh, so I, I went there and it did not disappoint. Anyway, so in this case, I was expecting actually a kind of a letdown uh, that we were going to see the stone jars and um, it was not a letdown. We went to Vientiane, which is the capital of Laos, and then we um, took a very small 12 seater plane to Chiang Kuang Kong and a uh, tiny little plane. It's nice because normally when I'm in a, a big 747 or something, I feel like I'm um, not really flying, you know? I, I, it feels like a sort of teleporter. I feel like I'm on a Star Trek Enterprise or something, and it's just this big humming room. But um, in this little plane, you really do feel like you're in the air, which probably for some people would be quite disconcerting, but I was like, looking out the window like, look, look how far, look, look down. And then my friend was like, I'm not looking down. So um, it's beautiful scenery, archipelagos in, in lakes. And um, and then we arrived in Jiang Kuang. And um, I think we were there early enough that we got to go straight away to one of the stone jar planes. Uh, and now, how to describe it? I mean, first they put you in this trolley. When we arrived at the site, you buy your ticket and they were in this like little cart, which is kind of like the Jurassic Park sort of a tour thing. And, and then it goes up a hill and then they let you out and it's just jars everywhere. <laughs> it's just like these. And there's nobody there because 
this isn't really known about this site. And, and one of the problems was that um, during the war, there were a lot of mines, landmines put down in this area and um, they had to defuse them before they could make open the site to, for people to see it. And I think just in the week that we were there, it was declared World Heritage status. So um, I thought it was just so atmospheric because when you go to magical places around the world that are very visited and have seen a lot of tourism, they tend, in my experience, to not have much mojo. Um, for instance, Stonehenge, um, oh, I don't know where else I've been, some places in India, uh, like the Sriminakshi Temple. I didn't feel like that much thrumming energy when I was there because I, I was very much perceiving the sort of very um, sterilizing influence of, of the tourist industry, and um, which seems to sort of overlay that. Whatever, whatever mystical energy might have been there otherwise. And uh, in this case, it was really humming. I mean, um, so now when we were talking to the tour guide who met us at the airplane, he had explained that there were several sites that we could visit and there were like three different sites with stone jars that were safe to visit and that there was also um, a Russian tank and a cave where a lot of people had been shot by the army. Um, I'm not exactly historically informed about Laos. I know that it was bombed by the US during the Vietnam War. I'm not exactly sure why they felt the need to bomb Laos as well, but because um, I think that Laos was supposed to be an ally anyway. And then you know, Laos had its own conflicts, and I believe now it has a socialist government, um, as, but it's also a kingdom, sort of. And anyway, so um, supposedly a whole bunch of villagers had been shot in this cave, and, and when the tour guide told me about that, I really didn't want to visit that cave. Um, now, when we went to the stone jar plane, the first site, there was a cave. I am not sure if this is that cave or if it's another cave. And I have looked on Wikipedia and I'm confused, but um, what there is in this cave, because we did go inside, was uh, a lot of shrines, uh, kind of like a stacked stone, um, little, you know when you, you stack a bunch of stones on, on onto each other and it goes up into a tapered top, kind of. Um, in India we call that a lingam, but um, I don't. I think there's another word for it. It's not a cairn though, because a cairn is a whole bunch, a whole cluster. Anyway, so um, there were a lot of those and a lot of incense burning. And it was interesting because as soon as you stepped into the cave, uh, it was silent. Like you know, you step outside the cave, you can hear birds. Can hear uh, people walking around because there were a few Laotian and Chinese people who had come to see also, although very very few, honestly. And um, and then you step back in the cave and it's dead silent. And it's a quite a wide opening too. It's like this yawning cave mouth. And uh, and then there are two kind of chimney holes in the cave, and I don't know if those were quarried out or if they were there naturally, but. Um, I took pictures of that and it, I don't know, it's fascinating. Anyway, supposedly there's a theory that these stone jars were quarried from this huge behemoth of a rock that was kind of growing out of the hill and, um, and, and that, that's why that cave is there. To me, it doesn't look that old. Um, it doesn't look, as compared to the jars, which look very weathered, of course they're outside as well, but um, it's very smooth, I mean, no, seemingly quite smooth anyway. So to me it looks sort of recently done, but uh, I'm not an expert on that. Anyway, so then we went back to our hotel and we went to sleep. And now I have to say here that um, I have been sleeping with an air conditioner for uh, two years now. I didn't used to do that at all, but now I'm quite used to it. And so um, there would have been 
the air conditioners in this hotel were not working, so there would have been definitely a change in body chemistry as a result of sleeping with no air. However, it's a lot cooler in Chiang Kong than in Bangkok as well. So I had the windows open. And uh, I had an experience in while well, I was somewhere in between sleep and waking that I have never had in my life, which was a form of what I could only describe as sleep paralysis. Um, and because I have seen videos about that, so I kind of, I recognize a little bit of the symptoms and uh, I could, so basically I was like aware that I was lying in my bed and suddenly I thought that there was someone in the room. And then I um, thought, oh, I'll just turn on the light and see who it is. But, and I was like, and then suddenly my heart started beating really, really fast. And I was not afraid in the way that you're afraid when you're awake. It was more like dream fear, which is always a little bit more diluted, I feel, or at least for me it is. And, um, but I noticed that my heart was like doing some really weird shit and it was like going faster and slower and stopping and then starting and it was, and I could hear it more than feel it. And I was like, oh my God, I have to uh, wake up. No, I didn't know that I was asleep. I thought I was awake, but I couldn't figure out why I couldn't move to turn on the light. And so then finally I managed to force myself up and to turn on the light and immediately upon turning on the light, I felt normal. And I realized that my heart was totally fine. Um, and that I must have been asleep and dreamed that whole s sort of segment, which was uh, all very fine and I would have dismissed it, but I was just telling this at breakfast to my friend who's in the neighboring room, uh, just as a, you know, a funny thing happened to me. And he said that um, he was, had an experience in the night uh, of being struck on the back of his neck several times with what felt like a pillow and uh, and that he also could not turn on the light and oh and then he said that uh, he did get up and turn on the light and then he went to go back to sleep and it ha started happening again so in a way his experience was much more dramatic than mine and um, I had actually done a prayer in the cave so this is just a little background. I don't know if it's different in Laos, but in Thailand, if you want to call a spirit, you light one stick of incense. And if you want to um, call a god or propitiate a god, you light three. And if you want to repel a spirit, you light seven. I believe that I had lit four in my room, which is something you just don't do in Thailand, <laughs> and probably not Laos, and it's, I know it's also not in India, you don't use even numbers ever. So um, so I, I don't know why, I don't know what using an even number does, I just know that it's generally considered bad juju. So um, I'm usually not superstitious about such things, so I, I continue to light as many sticks or a few as I think is appropriate in my own room, but um, it just may be worthy of note as we're telling this story. And uh, so, so that was, but that was in my room. Um, when I was in the cave, I lit three for the uh, God invocation, because I saw that that's what other people had done. So anyway, um, I'm, I don't know if there's much else to tell about this story. Um, I just thought it was really amazing experience and I don't know how many of my subscribers are pagan but this is kind of officially supposed to be a pagan channel in spite of recent videos and uh, uh, two other interesting details we saw many other jar sites and uh, one of them in one of them there were lids for the jars which surprised me because they were very well made ancient obviously weathered but stone lids that uh, were lying on the ground, but you could see that they fit perfectly, and um, and were probably reasonably airtight. And uh, and then the other thing is that there are two villages. One is called the Spoon Village, and one is called the Noodle Village. And in the Spoon Village, I thought it had something to do with the shape of the village. No, they make spoons. They make spoons out of tin, and uh, the whole village it seems to be supporting itself on a spoon industry, which I have never heard of. And I thought that was extremely interesting. Um, all they had was chickens and spoons. 
And then the Noodle Village, of course, makes noodles, and we saw the whole process, and it was very interesting. Um, probably, I know people in my family would flip over that, flip over that stuff, and um, I should write something to my aunt about what was going on in the Noodle Village. But for me, it was more the sort of uh, supernatural and mystical and folkloric things that were interesting. So I am going to post this video, and um, I'm very happy to have finally done something about sort of magical, mystical things. And um, the next time I go somewhere, I'm promising to try and take some footage because that was a very poor form to not succeed in getting any footage. I mean, possibly the giants or the spirits didn't want a YouTube video about their place. But anyway, I'm sure there is one already, so. That was my experience at Jiankuang. Blessed be.